Thank in advance the uh, folks who've helped out today. Uh, preaching this morning will be Paul Riggs. Uh, also participating as liturgists is Jeanette Price and also Josh Castleberry will be participating. If you would please uh, sign the attendance pads that are at the on the aisle side of each pew, pass those to those next to you so we'll have a record of your attendance. And I would like to welcome all first time and beyond first time visitors. We certainly welcome you here today. I'd like to recognize also in the congregation today are Joseph and Kathy James. Raise your hand so everybody know who you are. They're, they're visiting today. We, this morning, Joseph sat in the balcony, so we were all able to see him watching us uh, during the early service, and he was up there taking notes, doing this and doing that. Uh, just a few announcements. All of these are in your bulletin. Uh, first of all, on Sunday, next Sunday, October 22, the United Methodist Women will host a general meeting in the Fellowship Hall. Kathy James, Reverend Kathy James, who is the Director of Connectional Ministries for the South Carolina Annual Conference will be the guest speaker. There will be light refreshments and we urge all the ladies of the church to attend. Uh, it's in bold print in your bulletin. There is a large print edition of the United Methodist Hymnal. If you want one of those, ask an usher uh, for a copy to use during the service. On Wednesday from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., uh, you can get a flu shot in the fellowship hall. Uh, it will cost $25 if it is not covered by your insurance. If you do have an insurance card, please bring it with you. And if you have Medicare, uh, the shot is free. Bring that card with you too. Kick and Kick Jr. will meet this evening at 4 o'clock in the Williams Bryce Center. And Encounter is at 5 o'clock in the Williams Bryce Center. Two weeks from the day at 5 o'clock p.m. to 6.30 uh, will be the Trinity Fall Festival. Uh, that the information on that is in your bulletin there is a chili cook-off uh, that should be a lot of fun so so take a look at that in your order of worship there are no other announcements any more announcements joseph all right if you would please now stand and greet your neighbors friends and those you don't know in the name of the lord Just in case uh, it didn't get caught when we went on the air with the radio, I would like to note that Trinity United Methodist Church is at 226 West Liberty Street in Sumter, the corner of Liberty Street and Council Street. 
It is Laity Sunday, so those of you listening on the radio may hear some unfamiliar voices. just want to let you know that. If you would please join me in the call to worship uh, that is in your order of worship. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations.
be seated. If you would please pray with me the opening prayer printed in your bulletin. Holy God, you set before us every day a bounty of good things. Bring us to your feasting table, hungry for your word, eager to rebuild the cities you have made, and ready to receive strangers so that we celebrate at all times and in all places the peace which is life in you. Amen. Good morning. Our Old Testament lesson this morning is from the book of Psalms. I'll read from Psalm 95, verses 6 through 11. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. Today, if only you would hear His voice. Do not harden your hearts as you did in Meribah, as you did that day in Massa in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me. They tried me, though they had seen what I did. For forty years I was angry with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Our epistle lesson this morning is from Paul's letter to the Philippians. The Apostle Paul, not my friend Paul. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I long and love, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Yodia, I plead with Syndici to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. The word of God for the people of God. Now if our children would come forward for children's moments, please. We love you, 
and we thank you. Good morning. Um, before I, I read the gospel lesson, um, I, I have a, a quick disclaimer that I'd like to give. Well, Buck asked me to, to thank Emily. Emily did a great job with the children's service. She came and did the early service, too, and did a fantastic job. So thank you so much for that. Um, but before I read the scripture, I, I feel compelled to give you all this disclaimer. Um, Regarding after I, I read the lesson, you know, I, I don't really have any knowledge. I did, you know, I read, I research, um, but I don't have any authority. So I feel like I need to say to take it with a grain of salt um, because you, you might leave here thinking, oh, my goodness, you know, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But on the other hand, you know, I, I was telling Sunday school this morning that, um, that, you know, I give it to God. He'll do something with it no matter what I say. Um, so while preparing for this message, I just want to say, hang in there. Um, you know, last night as I was trying to, to finish it up, I, I fell asleep. And so, <laughs> you know, as, as we through this, if I lose a couple of you, I understand and I'm not going to be mad at you. Um, but I've got a good view up here, so I'll be able to tell. Um, now, I'm, I'm the kind of person that's always openly admitting all of my downfalls and my own personal ignorance. Um, an example of that was in Sunday school last week. Uh, we, were, we were discussing a verse. I don't remember what verse it was, but it referred to yokes. Um, and now I, I know what a yoke is, you know, and, and it made me remember um, a, a scripture that I heard my whole life, which was 2 Corinthians 6.14. And it says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I heard that my whole life. 
Um, and like I said, I know what a yoke is. I know it's that harness that you put on a mule or an ox or something to help it move the plow or pull a buggy or something, you know, one of those things. But my whole life listening to Sacred Corinthians, I thought it was talking about egg yokes. My whole life. And just last week is whenever I realized that the whole scripture made sense to me, you know. Um, and so I might go in the wrong direction with this. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to get something from that. I'll tell you the story one because I think it's funny, but also our scripture lesson today is about understanding the scriptures and how God can help us to understand it. Also, you know, when, when we read the scripture, uh, it can mean different things to different people. We can, it can illumine us in different ways, I guess. Um, so as we prepare our hearts, um, will you please stand for the reading of the gospel in Luke chapter 4. Verses 45 through 49. I'll actually start um, on verse 44 because that's where the paragraph is for the Pew Bible. Um, so it's probably important. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And then he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in the name of all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised, so stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. The Word of God for the people of God. Okay, please be seated. As we prepare for worship, let's go to God in prayer. Father God, thank you for this church family that you have given us. Thank you for the words of your servant, Luke. And please be with us today and bless our time together. Amen. Um, I, had, I had a moment of panic up here just a little bit ago when Josh was reading. Um, I started looking around for my glasses. I thought I'd forgotten them, which is going to be really funny later if you, if you pay attention to what I'm saying, um, because I'm going to have to read some, and it's not pretty if I don't have my glasses. Um, now, in reflecting on the, the passage from Luke, um, I thought about mine and Gloria's start in our relationship. We had an interesting start to our relationship. It wasn't unlike many, many relationships where uh, a friend of ours set us up, introduced us, and, and initially we spoke to each other on the phone. And we talked for a while one evening, and I finally convinced her to, to go out on a date with me. And then when we first met in person, and I saw her for the first time, I was absolutely blown away. I didn't know what I was going to do, because I am quite certain that she's 
the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen in my whole life. I was thinking there is no way that I'm getting a second date with this one because she is so far out of my league. But we were getting to know each other. Um, we were, everything was going really, really well. I mean, I got a third and a fourth date even. We enjoyed spending time with each other. She laughed at all of my goofy jokes. Uh, she seemed to genuinely enjoy spending time with me. And I knew that she was out of my league. But I was just like, don't question it, man. Just go with it. Just, you know, just hang in there. Um, and then we went on a date. One of our dates, we went to a football game at Delta State University where Gloria and I went to college and, and we're watching the game and I noticed at one point during the football game that she's, she's squinting, she's trying to see the score, she couldn't see it. And I was like, I said, are, are you having a hard time seeing, um, seeing the scoreboard, these gigantic numbers on the scoreboard? And, and she says, um, it was the cutest thing I'd ever seen in my life. Um, she said, I, you know, I asked her if she could see it and she said, well, I hadn't been able to find my glasses for about a month. And, and I said, I, I, instantly I started thinking, I said, yeah, you know, um, we've been seeing each other for about a month. <laughs> so I said, well, no wonder she was smitten with me so quickly because bless her heart, she couldn't see. She actually thought I was really a good looking guy, okay? Um, and, you know, I, I think that was a God thing. So she hung in there with me, you know. But then, uh, not too long after that, I was hanging out with her at her house and I felt something poking me in my side. And I put my hand in between the cushions of the couch and I found her glasses. And, uh, you know, for a moment there, I, I, I about played the hero. I about gave her her glasses back, you know. There you go. But then I thought for a second, wait a minute. What is going to happen? <laughs> I don't know how this is going to work out. What's going to happen whenever I give this beautiful girl her glasses back and she sees what she's been walking around with <laughs> for the last few weeks? Um, so it didn't take me long to, to just think, and, and, and you know, I, I'd say I prayed about it, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> it didn't take me long to figure out what I was going to do. You know, I did what anybody would do. I hid those glasses on top of a refrigerator. <laughs> And I married her just as quickly as I could. <laughs> so Gloria and I dated for a grand total of about four or five months. And for um, some reason, I tricked her into marrying me. Now, she swears that um, she's heard me tell the story before. And she thinks I'm making up that part about the refrigerator. But most of that story is true. Um, let me fast forward about 15 years. Okay. Uh, Gloria and I had grown together over several years of, of growing pains. You know, if you talk to married couples that have made it, you know, like we have made it. You know, she's my life now. Um, but, you know, the first few years can be a little rocky. You're getting used to, to living with one another, you know, the different things. And one of the, I think, maybe thousands of hurdles that Gloria and I had to, to get over, um, it's a little harder to say with her watching me this time, is that she could be kind of a persnickety person. Um, I say persnickety, I mean, I don't want to stand here in front of the church and say that my bride is picky, but I just, it didn't seem like I could do anything right. And I was a young man. I see a lot of the men in the audience are looking at me like, you're an idiot. <laughs> but, um, but it was one of the things that we had to get through. God bless her. Um, I just couldn't do anything right. But, you know, one thing that I felt like I could always do right, and she always complimented me on, was making sandwiches. I knew I could do that, you know. I, and I've turned out that's all that I could cook early on. You know, she's trained me well. I can do better with other things. But I could make a sandwich. I could make just a spectacular sandwich. Um, but, you know, never failed. You know, every time I made one of these glorious sandwiches, my bride would come behind me just talking about the enormous mess that I'd made. And I thought she was nuts. I thought she was crazy because I knew, I knew that I had cleaned up my mess. I knew I didn't leave a mess, and I knew that we were, we were. She was just being, she was just being crazy. Um, so we just we dealt with that, and it was a point of contingency for a little while, you know. But then later on, in in our relationship, I started reading more. Um, God gave me an incredible thirst for biblical knowledge, which I still have, and I don't think a guy can ever fully quench. And so I kept reading. Um, and I found that I could read better if I wore some reading glasses. Um, and so I started wearing reading glasses. And then eventually, Gloria convinced me to, to go to the eye doctor 
and, and get my eyes checked out. And, you know, so I did. I wasn't expecting much. You know, I figured the guy would say, yeah, stick with your readers. You'll be fine. I asked him, Doc, how's, you know, what, what do you say? What, what, what's it look like? And, uh, and he said, well, sir, the, the vision problems in your left eye are significant. That hit me in the face like a brick. I was 35, 36, and I had no idea I had significant vision problems. So I was like, wow, okay, well, you know, so uh, I ordered the glasses, and we went and got the glasses, and I put them on, and, and on the ride home, I started to see things. I mean, it was incredible. You know, we're going down the road, and as oncoming traffic's coming, you know, and if you didn't know this, you need to go get your glasses checked, but whenever people are coming, from the opposite direction, you know, you can see their faces and what kind of mood they You can see every, you can see it. I mean, I just figured it was something you weren't supposed to see. Just glass was blurring it out or no, you're supposed to see it. And like the planes, whenever the airplanes are flying in the air and they leave that streak of steamy smokes, the, you know, the cloud looking. You can actually see the airplane that's in front of it. Just shining. Right? I never, never could see that before. And so this is just spectacular, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking, wow, you know, 36 years old, had no idea. But the fun really started when we got home, okay? And my visual perception of my life got completely altered. When, um, when we got home, you know, I, I, I was hungry. I was reading words, and I was like, oh my goodness, look at all these words. They're wonderful words. And, but I got hungry, and so I went to the kitchen to make one of my glorious sandwiches, which have become much better over the years made a, a wonderful sandwich and is, is my habit I just picked it straight up and I went to the sink and I was going to eat it over the sink but as I picked it up in the paper towel and I looked back there were crumbs everywhere <laughs> everywhere I was like I couldn't even eat the sandwich I just put it down I was like and I looked at the counter and I'm like oh my goodness I had cooked a meal and I just there's stuff that I had no idea just little you know, things spatter and they spackle in the, the stuff that I couldn't see. And I was like, oh my goodness. And I was so ashamed. Um, I was just embarrassed. I was like, oh my goodness, all these years I thought she was just nuts. And I'm like, you know what? I'm, and I tried to retreat to my personal fortress of solitude. I think any man needs a place like this. Um, but the one room in my house where I live, I've got four daughters and a wife and now like six cats running around the place that have actually inhabited this fortress um the one place that i could go to get away you know like any man needs um i always thought that my family just respected this place as daddy's spot the place where daddy could go and, and be alone and i thought that they they knew and respected that but as i walked in there with my new gift of vision i realized that there's a whole nother reason why they didn't go in there <laughs> it was nasty it's like you know that's your place so you nobody else wants to go there um it was just you know so as i as i walked out of the half bath off of our laundry room okay which was disgusting i won't wear my glasses into a public restroom ever again um i was just so embarrassed and i'm so ashamed and i still you can ask my wife i still apologize to her every now and then it's kind of funny you know because i'll be trying to get brownie points for something or another and i'll, I'll clean the kitchen um, and after I finished cleaning the kitchen, I said, Gloria, I cleaned the kitchen. Before she gets any kind of impression, she looks at me, she said, were you wearing your glasses? <laughs> so, you know, we, we move on and, and we finally, you know, God bless her. She, you know, I really, my perception of the situation was that my wife had a problem. I thought she was some kind of crazy, obsessive, compulsive, like she had a crazy people problem, you know? And as it turns out, she didn't have a crazy people problem. She had a nasty blind husband problem, you know? <laughs> And so my perception of the whole situation got completely, it was an awakening for me personally. Um, when we, we look at Luke 24, we hear the story about Jesus appearing to his disciples after his resurrection. Um, specifically in verse 45, Luke says, Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. I find this to be very, very powerful because I believe the Spirit opens our minds and opens our hearts as well. Um, I think it moves us whenever we decide how to give to others and what we do for others. Sometimes, um, sometimes whenever I see people asking for money or they seem hungry or something, for some reason I don't feel a strong urge to give to them. You know, and I don't know, that might be 
just the spirit working in my heart. You know, it sounds, I still have compassion and I care about those people, but I don't always feel led to give. Um, that might come from working in a high school. If anybody in here works in a high school, you know, they never seem to have any cash money. So I get mystery. It's going to have a dollar 50,000 times a day. You know, it's all the time. Um, but I just don't always feel led to give. But when sometimes whenever I see people in need, I feel an overwhelming urge, not necessarily to, to give them money, but, you know, want to go and, and buy them dinner and bring them some food so they're not hungry. Um, but it's not all the time. And I, but I believe that this is the Holy Spirit influencing my life. I think that's how he moves in my life. Um, I also think that people have different callings when it comes to giving and what they do with their gifts. Um, you know, there, there are so many different causes out there. There's feed the children, there's clothe the children, there's teach the children to read good, there's give the children clean water. And then you get into all the charities for the poor, sick puppies and kittens out there. You know, I mean, there's just a lot going on. If a person were to send money or give their time to every charity that's asking for their money or their time, then they would have to find, I don't write it now because I thought it was pretty clever. They would have to find a charity called Feed the Starving Working Professional because he gave all his money away. <laughs> I believe that when we listen to the Spirit, I believe that when we listen to the Spirit, that we're able to discern what our spiritual gifts are. And when we discern what our spiritual gifts are and where we're called to give and what we're called to do, then we can make a greater impact. Um, another way I think that the Spirit influences us is by what we believe. By this, I don't mean that the Holy Spirit controls our mind because you know that we have free will to decide. Um, I don't believe that they, He controls our mind, but I do believe that the Holy Spirit allows us to believe in the unbelievable when we listen to God. Now hang in there with me on this one, okay? Let's think about this. We're very well educated people, okay? We know many, many things, um, but we still believe in unbelievable things. Through science, we've been able to prove that all matter is made of three things. Protons, electrons, and neutrons. I'm not going to get into a science lesson, even though I'm a big science nerd and I get excited about electrons. But everything, you, me, the floor, the pew, the electronics in this room, all is made of three building blocks. Protons, electrons, and neutrons. To me, that's overwhelming evidence of God's existence and His overwhelming power. Um, but we still believe in supernatural things. All the things made up of these particles, we have incredible knowledge about our planet, about physics and chemistry and biology. So why would we believe some of the things that we believe? Why would we believe that Moses was able to part the Red Sea? That a burning bush was not consumed by fire, that dead men were brought back to life, or that water was turned into wine? I mean, let's think about it. It's thought that the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. I actually did research on this part of it, okay? It's not just my babblings, okay? It's thought that the Israelites crossed the Red Sea in an area that was 205 meters deep. That's shallow compared to the rest of the Red Sea, which at the deepest points are between 800 and 1,800 meters deep. But still, 205 meters deep, that's the depth of the length of over two football fields, which is significant. Why would an intelligent, well-educated group of people believe that that could happen without the influence of the Holy Spirit? Again, I don't mean to say that the Holy Spirit controls our minds. I just believe that the Holy Spirit opens, opens our minds and enables us to know that all these things are true, as I believe that they are. Please, please indulge me for one more point. When we let Jesus into our hearts, I believe that the Holy Spirit fills us and we believe these things. Now, if you were blessed as I was to be raised in a loving Christian home, you probably heard your mother say, as I heard my mother say, that when you hear Jesus knocking at your heart, all you have to do is let him in. Did you all hear anything like that as children? Okay. All you have to do is let him in when you feel Jesus knocking at your heart. Now, and, and I believe that. Okay. And I did that. But what Luke says in verse 45, 
is that when your minds are open to understand the scriptures, not only will you understand the scriptures, but you will also see the world from an entirely different perspective. I believe personally that spiritual perspective is a very, very powerful thing. When you see things from a Christian or a spiritual point of view. Um, you know, when, when I couldn't see very well, my perception was that my wife was crazy. Okay? When my wife didn't have her glasses and she couldn't see very well, God bless her, she thought I was really a very good looking man. Okay? But when the Spirit opens our eyes, we see the world differently. Without the Spirit, the world seems just unfair, cruel, harsh, scary. But when the Spirit opens our minds and we see the world with a spiritual perspective, we see what we really need. And that has been taken care of. We see the world isn't as scary because God will provide for us. And those things that we just had to have before aren't nearly as important anymore. Now in closing, when we see the world with a spiritual perspective, we know that all of those miracles in the Bible happen. We just know it. You know, it's not like we believe it. Okay? You know it. You know these things happen. We know that Jesus is the Son of God. We know that he died for our sins, and we also know that one day he's going to return and take us with him. Another thing that I know is that I know what to say when people ask me why I believe in God, because inevitably we encounter those who do not believe in God. And I know what to say to them. I say that I know that God exists. I believe in God because I feel his spirit move me. I feel him within me, and I know it. And I tell those people that I'm going to pray for them. This is another thing that the Spirit does through the power of prayer. I believe that when we pray for people, we tell people that we're praying for them. I believe whether they want it to or not, I believe that it softens their heart. Okay? That's one thing that the Spirit will do. The Spirit will soften their heart. And whenever the Spirit softens those people's heart, then they will allow the Spirit to move in them. And they too will feel the presence of God. They too will feel Jesus knocking at their heart like my mama said. And they too can enter the fold. Thank you all very much. And I don't know how to close this properly, but God bless you. Thank you, Paul. We'll continue our worship by professing our faith together using the Apostles' Creed, uh, which is on page 881 of your hymnal, please stand. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. And the third day, He rose from the dead. He is in the heaven, and is the right hand. Please be seated. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Almighty God, the source of light, life, and strength, we implore your blessings upon Trinity United Methodist Church, our pastor, staff, each one of us, and our families so that we all may be strengthened to do your will. We ask that you give Angela the peace and renewal she so much deserves, even though we are counting down the days to her return. 
guide and strengthen those upon whom rests the authority of government. Keep safe those who serve this nation in and out of uniform. Enlighten with wisdom those who teach and those who learn. And grant to all of us the opportunity and willingness to prove ourselves worthy citizens of our city, county, state, and country. We pray for those who have experienced loss and sorrow and that you will comfort the grief-stricken with your all-healing grace and love. We pray that we will be more aware of those around us who are much less fortunate than we and that we will not resort to excuses to avoid serving them. We ask forgiveness for our human frailties and the weakness we display when we should be strengthened by your grace and Holy Spirit. We pray we will be devoted to truth, given to unselfish service, loyal to every obligation of life, and above all, to you. Grant to each one of us in our own lives a humble heart, a steadfast purpose, and a joyful hope, with readiness to endure hardship and suffering if need be, so that your truth may prevail among us and that thy will may be done on earth. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Now there will be a video stewardship moment starring our own Joseph James. Hi, I'm Joseph James, pastor here at Trinity with this week's stewardship moment. As we prepare for Commitment Sunday 2017, let's examine another aspect of our ministry together and about how your gifts are making a difference. This morning, I want to talk about staff costs within the budget of Trinity. As you may know, Trinity employs nearly 20 people. They are employed at an hourly or session cost basis. Some are employed on a part-time basis, and others are still employed on a full-time capacity. The staff at Trinity work in many different areas, from the nursery to sectional leaders in the choir, to musicians and directors, to administrative support staff, to maintenance and janitorial staff. It even includes the clergy. Our budget for staff costs is about $410,000, or about 45% of our budget. For a church the size of Trinity, that is not out of the ordinary. Staff costs, as you know, are not a dead-end expense. The staff at Trinity equips the congregation to do the ministry of this place, as well as assist us in carrying out that ministry. Trinity also utilizes persons for specialized work, such as the ministries of music, children and youth, pastoral care, as well as educational and pastoral leadership. For a church this size, we need a business manager, a secretary, as well as janitorial staff to deal with the day-to-day issues that arise for a congregation that is active and at work in the world as Trinity is. Currently, your staff parish relations committee is looking to fill vacancies in ministries with our children and youth. By your gifts to the general fund, you mobilize this church for ministry. Thank you for what you do to make a difference for Christ in the world through your tithes and offerings. Very soon, you should receive a pledge card in the mail for your prayerful consideration of your 2018 gifts to Trinity. In years past, church members have turned in a pledge card with their projected giving for the next year. 
A staff person would collect this information, and as part of the quarterly giving statement, the staff person would indicate how persons were doing on their annual pledge. To many persons, the quarterly statement became like a quarterly bill. How much do we owe God this month? Instead, this year, your commitment to Trinity will not be about turning in a pledge card to be reviewed by a staff member. Instead, you will put your pledge card in an envelope with your address on it and seal it. On October 29th, you will place that sealed envelope in a locked box at the communion rail. Your envelope will remain in that locked box for nearly a year, when next year this time it will be mailed back to you. What you pledge to Trinity will be between you and God. You will still receive quarterly statements of your gifts, but it will not have your pledge information on that quarterly statement. I encourage you to prayerfully consider your financial commitment to the work of God through Trinity for 2018. Thank you for what you do to make Trinity United Methodist Church a place for the work of Christ in the world. May God bless you.
Before I dismiss, I feel like I, I need to thank the tech guys because we all know how that goes. You know, technology's great when it works, right? Um, okay, as we go forth, I pray that the Holy Spirit blesses all of you. I pray that, pray that He softens your hearts so that you can feel a move. In your name we pray. Amen.